Hello there, watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making the headlines with Matthew Said, columnist for The Times and Sunday Times, and the broadcaster and political commentator Salma Shah. Welcome to both of you. Uh, seismic times indeed with that uh, breaking news this evening, but let's see how the newspapers uh, have managed to cover the story so far. The Guardian leading with the story that a number of Afghan children are feared dead after a US drone strike near Kabul. The Telegraph says the RAF is ready to launch fresh strikes against ISIS-K militants in Afghanistan. Well, The Times says the Pentagon appears to be blaming the UK for last week's suicide bomb at Kabul airport, allegedly by keeping open the gate where it happened. Longest day, that is the lead for the Metro, which focuses on those Afghans who are still hoping to flee Kabul as the last Western forces pull out. But as The Sun puts it, we're in charge now with pictures of Taliban members wearing Afghan police uniforms. Well, the Financial Times says that a surge in COVID cases in three US states has sparked fears that travel restrictions may have to be reimposed by the EU. While the Daily Mail leads with news that ministers are looking at attacks on disposable nappies to try to get parents to switch to greener alternatives. Daily Express has another of its many recent stories about threats to scrap the pensions triple lock with a warning to the Chancellor not to double-cross pensioners. And the Daily Mirror looks forward to British summertime 2022, the headline, We Do Love to Be Beside Our Seaside. So let's bring in Matthew Said uh, from The Times, broadcaster and political commentator Sue Salma Shah. Welcome to both of you. Um, I suppose the prize goes to the Metro for updating their front page. We saw an old one there. Uh, their new front page already says the last flight. Um, Matthew, uh, celebratory gunfire from the Taliban in Kabul and it all came to an end so quickly. Matthew, apologies. I think you need to unmute yourself. Apologies. It's, it's been so long since I've done this. I, <laughs> I, it's, it's a phrase that I've heard often over the course of the pandemic, but apologies, I had, I had muted. Um, I think this has been a, obviously a huge strategic reversal uh, for the West, the, the folly of trying to nation build, to impose our values and sensibilities on a society that is so incredibly different from a cultural perspective, uh, a tribal perspective, the ethnic affiliations that predated the formation of the nation of Afghanistan. Um, I think it's a mistake to focus too much on the, I mean, it's a terrible error that the allies have made in the chaos of the withdrawal, the letting down of people who supported us uh, whilst we were there for this two decade period. But that shouldn't obscure the key strategic misjudgments of the Blair and Bush era. And unless we're capable of extracting the lessons from this very sorry history, I don't think we'll be in a position to adequately shape the future in the interests of the West and to combat a increasingly resurgent and confident China. So sorry, just to, to, for you to explain what you mean more specifically, do you mean leaving Afghanistan and join, joining a field of conflict in Iraq at the time and not effectively finishing the job? What, 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 which are the strategic errors you're talking about? So, so I, I think at the Bonn talks, the original strategic error is that the Bonn talks of 2001, we tried to create a coherent nation state along Western lines. Uh, Talib, the Afghanistan is a nation divide. I mean, 14 ethnicities are mentioned in the national anthem. And these ethnic allegiances are historic. They're ancient. Uh, they've been warring for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it was, I think, a mistake in that original conception. And then, of course, we back the Northern Alliance uh, in its attempt to overturn the Taliban in the period after 2001 without recognising that the Taliban isn't just a group of religious fundamentalists. It's also dominated by ethnic Pashtuns. And the, the majority Pashtun population became paranoid that the Tajiks and Uzbek dominated Northern Alliance would carry out terrible reprisals, which they did. But this tribal blind spot in Western foreign policy isn't just true of Afghanistan, it's true of Vietnam, it's true of Iraq. It's a litany of errors. And we haven't yet learned from our mistakes. And I hope very much 
uh, that despite, I think we're right to focus on the chaos of the withdrawal, we need to learn that central lesson if we're going to get our foreign policy uh, better in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. You're, you're drawing on geopolitics, history, the complexity of the situations on the ground. It's hard to make a newspaper headline out of that, though, isn't it? The Guardian, for example, Salma, uh, Afghan children feared dead in US drone strike, a family of 10, um, multiple children, more children uh, that died in this, uh, some of them very young. And it's easy to focus on these incidents, is it not? Which is now, yet again, the front of terror in Afghanistan against ISIS-K. Yeah, and I think this is important because uh, the issue is about what's happening in the immediate. And Matthew's right to focus on, you know, learning lessons from this um, Afghan escapade. But that is going to happen in longer term. Right now, we are still not out of the situation. So even though the last flight has gone out of Afghanistan with safe passage and agreement, actually, the fact that ISIS-K is going back in and has found a new breeding ground where they've moved out of Syria and where they've been um, holed up in, the, in, the recent, in recent years, just goes to show that actually this is not sort of a cliff edge where we're cut and dry on this. And actually, sadly, you know, in a US drone strike, there's been poor information that seems like it's led to the death of these children. And that sort of tragedy is going to become quite symbolic of what is going to happen in Afghanistan, I think, for a long time yet to come. Um, so... The Guardian focusing on those young children. The, the question now is of those also left behind. Uh, many have been in contact with journalists or indeed military personnel, UK or otherwise, that they've worked with. Um, they're desperate to get out. They may well have the right papers to get to the UK, for example, Matthew. But how do they do that? Do they walk to Pakistan where they're not allowed in? I mean, this, these are desperate scenes which is a reminder of what it is like, which we, we don't necessarily understand in this country, of what it is like to live in fear. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I think the people who are in fear are those who, who worked with, with the West, um, and they doubtless are rational in fearing reprisals, uh, potentially from the Taliban. You will have noticed a softening of the rhetoric from Western leaders about the Taliban and potentially wanting to work with them uh, and to uh, provide aid. The only leverage that I can see, the, the, the main leverage that the West has, I think, is uh, financial rather than military. Uh, it's an incredible thing to note that the GDP in Afghanistan is, is about $20 billion, uh, compared with sort of $3 trillion for the UK and over $20 trillion for the US. And about $8 billion of that in Afghanistan is aid. So we do have a bargaining chip, and we may well be able to cooperate with them in trying to secure the release of some of these people. But that remains to be seen. We really don't know what kind of... Co I mean, the Taliban, we think of it as a unified force. It is a coalition itself, a uh, very fragile coalition. And I think it's still very early to determine what kind of a uh, polity will emerge from this. I mean, it's not impossible that Afghanistan will defend, uh, descend, as it did after the Soviet occupation, into another very bitter and very bloody civil war. Yes, we watch and wait, don't we, and see, and see what happens. Uh, but certainly the US operation with the drone strikes that we've seen, uh, Salma, picks us to the, or leads us to the Daily Telegraph, which suggests that the RAF itself is ready to uh, launch or join in with those attacks. The RAF, the paper says, ready to launch fresh Islamic State strikes in Afghanistan. And this is the great fear now, not just there, but in terms of the export of terrorism too. Exactly. I mean, this is the reason that, uh, you know, Western powers went into Afghanistan in the first place, because it was targeting al-Qaeda. Um, whereas in some cases, you can think of the Taliban as benign because it acts domestically, um, but it allows uh, the breeding ground for international terrorism. So, you know, ISIS-K is today's al-Qaeda. I think the issue is that if the RAF is prepared to, to do this and support the US with airstrikes, you know, is there going to be a question further down the line as to whether we need to do this independently without US support? There are also gaps in questions around what the US is willing to do, and it's not really showing its hand, as well as trying to understand, um, you know, where the Taliban might move um, from, from where it was 20 years ago, and whether they can be a power that we can negotiate with 
negotiate with, with our leverage, as Matthew rightly points out, with aid, or whether we are going to have to use a firmer hand and have these threats of airstrikes constantly hanging over them. Uh, the UK Defence Secretary, Matthew, talked about um, his belief of 1,100 people that they would have liked to get out. The Guardian uh, says that MPs are scrambling to rescue more than 7,000 constituents and family members trapped in Afghanistan, according to figures provided to The Guardian. Scores of Labour MPs have been inundated with pleas for help from thousands of constituents whose relatives have been left stranded since the UK's final emergency airlift left Kabul. I mean... <laughs> You know, I mean, we're going back to those left behind. It's not, it's not the only part of this story. But really, these are people who, who fear for their lives and have family connections in the UK and have the right paperwork. Um, it just almost shows the inability now of the West to do anything about it. We, we're in the hands of the Taliban, if I can put it that way. Yeah, this is true. And it's also worth bearing in mind that those who escape, because of the clan a structure of Afghan society, they will have extended kin who are left back in Afghanistan who may well themselves be on the receiving end of reprisals, because often in these kinds of societies, there is corporate guilt. If a person does something wrong, you can take revenge on their cousin or some other uh, clan proxy. So it's a horribly difficult situation. One thing to bear in mind, however, is it's very difficult to get an accurate analysis of public opinion in Afghanistan. But one survey by Pew in 2013 is that 99% of the Afghan population, these are not the people who we're seeing on our screens at the moment, favor Sharia law, 85% favor stoning for adultery, um, and 80% another pretty brutal uh, retribution for a certain type of religious crime. So it is quite, when we talk about we need to do something like this for the Afghan people who hate the Taliban, it's very difficult to tell exactly what level of support there is within Afghanistan for the Taliban. But I would say that part of that support is a deep fear of the chaos that could ensue if there is no uh, unifying power, however awful. That, that, I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, we've always wondered how many Afghans would support the Taliban over what was there. Um, but we heard today also from uh, Foreign Secretaries uh, Salma and the UN Security Council uh, this, this ambition that the gains of the last 20 years, mainly in women's rights and rights for minorities, I suppose, should not be lost. And how faint a hope is there uh, for those looking on that those gains will be allowed to continue? Uh, this is so tricky because the reaction of, of those women who've held prominent positions and their scramble in, in some high-profile cases to leave Afghanistan suggests that the Taliban are not in any mind um, to want to try and uh, hold on to any of those, uh, any of that progress. So I think that it is an incredibly faint hope. And as you've just heard, you know, Sharia law is built and stacked against women. And this is what the Taliban fundamentally believe. This is an ideological core. So I think it's sort of, I have to say, slightly ridiculous of us to think that the Taliban is going to change and allow any of this progress. And we have to sort of steel ourselves to the fact that this is going to be a real tragedy. And again, even though we were there and there for 20 years and this progress was made um, you know, under Western powers, essentially supporting uh, an Afghan government, this is not the primary reason that we were there. And if we talk about sort of the, the various things that, that are in the ether at the moment, you know, this is not part of our strategic military interest. And we'll wait to see whether there's enough sort of domestic goodwill towards this progress to be able to to keep it going through the Afghan people, because certainly there is no indication that the Taliban is going to want to keep this going. Well, Salma, Matthew, stay there. Lots more still to come, more from the newspapers. Uh, still waiting to hear also from the US Secretary of State uh, after these scenes in Kabul. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Just a reminder that we are waiting to hear from the US Secretary of State live from the State Department. Anthony Blinken expected shortly. We'll take you there live when that happens. Uh, in the meantime, let's continue our press preview. Joining me now, Matthew Side, columnist for The Times and Sunday Times, and the broadcaster and political commentator, Salma Shah. Welcome to both of you. Um, diverting attention away from Afghanistan just briefly, uh, Salma, to the FT. And this is uh, the rising number of cases of COVID 
COVID in the US uh, means that it's uh, gone on the EU, EU no-fly zone, if I can put it that way. Yes, this is quite a worrying development because it looked like the US was getting into a good place with its vaccination program, and according to the FT, it still is. But there is huge vaccination hesitancy, which is, uh, I think, slowing down some of the progress that the United States has made. The fact that the EU has put this um, on a no-travel and no-flight restriction uh, is also quite worrying for the UK, because if we leave ourselves open to the US, could this mean huge rises in COVID case numbers, especially as we're going through a process of uh, having our own boosters this winter? So uh, a hell of a lot of nervousness, I think, as a result of uh, this news. Uh, just seeing also that the uh, US president, while we just get more breaking news on Afghanistan, uh, says he will address the American people on Afghanistan on Tuesday. That's according to the White House. So we will hear words from the US president tomorrow on the issue of Afghanistan, not expecting him tonight. Uh, but he has written a statement uh, saying that he wanted to thank our commanders and the men and women serving under them for their execution of the dangerous retrograde from Afghanistan as scheduled in the early morning of August the 31st Kabul time with no further loss of American lives. Uh, the past 17 days, he says, have seen our troops execute the largest airlift in US history, evacuating more than 120,000 US citizens, citizens of our allies, the Afghan allies of the United States. They have done it with unmatched courage, professionalism and resolve. Now our 20-year military presence in Afghanistan, he said, has ended. Tomorrow afternoon, so that's Tuesday, I will address the American people on my decision not to extend our presence in Afghanistan beyond the 31st of August. For now, I will report that it was the unanimous recommendation of the Joint Chiefs and of all of our commanders on the ground to end our airlift mission as planned. Their view was that ending our military mission was the best way to protect the lives of our troops and secure the prospect of civilian departures for those who want to leave Afghanistan in the weeks and months ahead. He goes on to say, this is the statement from the US President, I've asked the Secretary of State to lead the continued coordination with our international partners to ensure safe passage for any Americans, Afghan partners and foreign nationals who want to leave Afghanistan. This will include work to build on the UN Security Council resolution passed this afternoon that sent the clear message of what the international community expects of the Taliban to deliver on moving forward, notably freedom of travel. The Taliban, the president said, have made commitments on safe passage and the world will hold them to their commitments. The words there of the US president. We will return to our press preview guests at half past 11, the very latest on the situation in Kabul where there has been celebratory gunfire from the Taliban tonight. Coming up in a few minutes time.